So please forgive us a little bit. This is our first time doing this, and so we're working out the bugs a little bit. I know it was a little hectic when we first had you come in, but we'll get better at it. So just give us a little bit of grace for our first time. Happy Father's Day to everyone. Amen. We will continue to do the drive-in worship service at 9 o'clock for those that feel more comfortable in that setting. We, we did an informal poll this morning, and we had from the sound of the horns that people want to continue to do the drive-in worship service. Some are just not ready to be here. So if you have any friends or neighbors that want to come to church but are a little bit uncomfortable coming back in this setting, we will still be doing the drive-in at 9 a.m., and we'll be doing this service at 11 a.m. And we will see as we hopefully prayerfully fill up that we may have to go to a third worship service. But as we can tell right now, I think we're okay with the, the separation that we have. Are, is everyone comfortable with the way that you're separated in this format? Everything's okay? All right, if, if, you, if you have any ideas or suggestions or concerns, don't be afraid to let us know. The office is open Tuesday through Friday. So just call in or text or email. You can email directly to me and let me know what your concerns or ideas are. We wanna make this as comfortable as we can. And obviously this is a totally different world and looking at you all, I actually kind of like it because I get to make some of you sit up front, which is nice. <laughs> so I don't feel so alone. But we are separated enough that we're safe. And we believe that this is a safe way to do this. Just so you know, before and after the services, we wipe down all the surfaces. Before, the, before and after the services, we wipe down all the surfaces to make sure that we are disinfecting. There are hand sanitizer stations throughout. You probably can't see them, but they're on either side of the front column. If you need to leave or need to go to the bathroom, first of all, the bathrooms are out that door. And if you need to leave, then you would obviously just come forward, go to the hand sanitizer station, and then go out that door for the bathrooms. There are bathroom attendants at the bathrooms, the men's and women's. There's a queue system set up in front of the bathroom so that everyone lines up six feet apart. And then you're able to go into the bathroom one at a time. You can also exit out this door if you need to go to your vehicle on that side of the property. Now, at the end of the service, we are going to dismiss you one pew at a time. And we'll have some going out the back. The back rows will go out the back row and the front rows will go out these rows. So for next Sunday, depending, and you probably did this when you came here, but depending on which side of the building you parked on, you want to come through those entrances because that's the way that you're going to be, you're going to exit. And so we don't want you to have to walk all the way around the building. And what we're trying to keep you from doing is walking across each other. The whole idea with this is that you come in through the back and then you'll be exiting those in the front will be exiting through these front doors, and then we'll take the, the people in the back out the back. And, and we're just trying to keep us from bumping into each other as much as possible. Does that make sense to everyone? And it, amen. And I know this is a little different, but we all need to get used to it, and we'll continue to make little tweaks as we figure out what we did wrong and what we can do right for next week. Amen? So... Let us start with a word of prayer. Loving God, you who are our father and our mother, we thank you that you have shown us how important it is to follow your example as we grow in faith. Teach us to be obedient to your will, respecting you as children ought to. Thank you for your mercy despite our disobedience. Strengthen us to stand up against the challenges of this world, honoring your name, trusting your grace. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. And we ask you at this time, we're going to go into our first song that you stay seated. 
We are not going to be singing like we normally would to hymns. This is more of listening meditatively and enjoying the beautiful music.
please stand for the reading of the word of God? Psalm chapter 86, verses 1 through 10. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till in heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three Oh 
Before we go into our time of prayer, I would like to first just thank those that have been involved with the reopening of the church. There has been both the trustees and the church council involved, but we also had a reopening group. And we met for many weeks, every week, coming up with the plan and making decisions on the best way to do this. And always the best plans, obviously when it comes time to implement them, sometimes get a little chaotic, as we saw this morning. But I believe that we have, and, and the group has done a really awesome job of coming up with the ideas so that we could come back together in person in a safe and responsible way. So you know who you are that have been involved with it. And we just want to thank you for, for doing that and for being such a big part of getting the church reopened. And we pray that as we go forward, we're able to do, uh, do more things to, to be able to come together, small groups. We have some of the groups that are going to be restarting shortly as they get their reopening plans turned into the office. All groups that are meeting here at the church have to have a written set of guidelines of the way that they're going to do their groups and to keep everybody safe. So we're not just doing in-person worship prayerfully in a safe and responsible way, but also all of the different groups, the small groups. And we, I know that we are working on getting the thrift store reopened. We have continued to do the Bread of Life, which has been an instrumental ministry of feeding this community. We are probably having about twice as many people coming and getting food on Friday mornings. So all of those that are involved in these different ministries and groups, we just thank you for all of the hard work that you put in. This has been a very obviously different and crazy time for, for, for everyone, but we think that we're on the right path of getting us back into church. Amen? We also want to pray for... Natalia and her husband. Natalia would have been here singing along with Wesley. She's from the nine o'clock worship team, but she was in a car accident last night and her and her husband are in the hospital. So I don't, I don't have all the details, but we just wanna keep her and her husband in our prayers at this time. Let us go to God in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, today we ask you to bless our earthly fathers for the many times they reflected the love, the strength, the generosity, wisdom, and mercy that you exemplify in your relationship with us, your children. We want to honor our fathers for putting our needs above their convenience and comfort, for teaching us to show courage and determination in the face of adversity, for challenging us to move beyond self-limiting boundaries, for modeling the qualities that would turn us into responsible, principled, caring adults. Yet not all of our fathers have lived up to these ideals. God, give them the grace to acknowledge and learn from their mistakes. Give us the grace to extend to them the same forgiveness that you have given to each of us. Help us to resist the urge to stay stuck in past bitterness. Instead, moving forward with humility and peace of heart. We also ask your blessing for those who have served as father figures in our lives when, other, when our biological fathers were not able to do so. May the love and selflessness they showed us be returned to them in all their relationships and help them to know that their influence has changed us for the better. 
give new and future fathers the guidance they need to raise happy and holy children, grounded in a love for God and other people, and reminded these fathers that treating their wives with dignity, compassion, and respect is one of the greatest gifts they can give their children. We pray that our fathers who have passed on to the next life have been welcomed into your loving embrace and that our family will one day be reunited in your heavenly kingdom. We ask all of this as we pray the prayer your son taught us to pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. for the reading of the word of God. Romans chapter six, verses one through 11. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin for whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him the death he died, he died to sin, once for all, but the life he lives. He lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. Please be seated.
choose to surrender our lives, willingly our knees will bow. With all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we gladly choose you. for the reading of the word of God. This is from Genesis chapter 21, starting at verse 8. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, but God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes Then she went and sat down opposite him, a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up, and he lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Parim, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit down into this place, into your church, into your people. Send your Holy Spirit into me. Transform us. Transform me. Change our hearts. Allow these words to become your words. This sermon to become your sermon. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. So there's a story of a little girl who was sitting on her grandfather's lap, and he was reading her a story while he slowly rocked on the front porch of their house. And the the little granddaughter was rubbing her face and then rubbing his face, and she was feeling the wrinkled, coarse skin of her grandfather 
and the soft, perfect skin of her cheek. And after a while of him reading the story to her, she interrupted him and said, Grandpa, did God make you? And he was taken aback by this question, but answered, of course he made me many, many years ago. And she then responded and asked, well, did God make me? And he said, of course, honey, God made you just a little bit ago, though. And he continued reading the story, and she continued to touch her face and to touch his face. And finally, after pondering these words, she interrupted him again and said, Grandpa, don't you think God has gotten better at this? <laughs> and it's a cute, funny story, but it brings truth to our lives and questions as well. Truth that we all, generation to generation, grow old and pass on to the next generation. But it brings up the question as, is God getting any better at this? Are we getting any better at this? And as we see into the world and see the images on the television and in the news, many of us may hesitate and answer, no, we're getting worse. The world is getting worse each day. The more technology, the more knowledge we have, it doesn't seem to make a bit of difference in the chaos in the world. And as we look at the scripture from Genesis today, we ponder these thoughts and questions about fatherhood and how are we leaving this world to the next generation? Are we getting any better? And just one note on the reading of the Old Testament. Many times I'm asked, why do we continue to focus on the Old Testament? Why don't we just focus on the good news of Jesus Christ in the New Testament? And there's many reasons and theologies to, to make the argument that we should continue to focus on both the Old and New Testament. But one of the things that I tell people, especially those that come into my office and ask me about reading the Bible, and where does these stories and where does this, these Old Testament books, how do they have any relevance in our life? And I tend to tell people, I challenge you to read the Old Testament. Read the Old Testament straight through and see if your story is not in there somewhere. I believe that through all of these stories, and the Old Testament is the story of the nation of Israel and their context with God, the falling away and coming back into relationship. But it's told through these individual stories. And this story today of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Isaac and Ishmael, this family, this broken family, is a story that many of us can connect with today. And we see this same type of story happening throughout our culture, our communities, and we see this brokenness and the sins of the father being passed on to the children still being very relevant to us today. And I believe that all of us, all of our stories are in the Bible somewhere. And that as we read the scripture, we see parts of our own life in these very intense and interesting and complicated stories. And this is one of those stories today, especially on Father's Day, if you think about the pain and the anguish that was caused by this separation of the family, and yes, there's a lot going on here. Remember that Sarah was unable to have children, and so she asked or she set up her hand servant, her handmaiden, Hagar, to have a child for Abraham. And even though God had promised Sarah 
that she would have children, she did this anyway. And so when Sarah miraculously in older stages of life had her son Isaac, she comes to this point. And it's easy for us to look harshly at Sarah here. It's easy for us to say, wow, Sarah, you really didn't have much of a heart for Hagar and her son, did you? But we have to remember that the reading of this may be a little differently in the ancient Hebrew, where it says that Ishmael was playing with Isaac. That translates actually in the ancient Hebrew as possibly being that Ishmael was picking on Isaac that he was playing rough with Isaac, that maybe he was teasing the younger boy. And so when Sarah saw this, her motherly instincts probably kicked in to protect Isaac. And also remember the complications of the firstborn that we don't really use as much in our society today, that then the firstborn male inherited everything and so Sarah was very defensive about her son, trying to protect him and make sure that he was accorded the birthright. And it is easy for us to look at Sarah as kind of the villain in this moment, but it's a very complicated story. And we should know that because many of our families today are very complicated, aren't they? The American family is not necessarily the family of two parents and children in a home for 30, 40, 50 years. Families today are usually from multiple marriages or relationships, or that the parents or the father, or the mother are not even present in the home. And so we live in a complicated place. We know that this is a complicated situation. And we can connect to it. As much as we think the world has gotten worse, it was pretty bad before too, wasn't it? And so when we see this separation happen and Abraham listens to Sarah and even to God, and cast them out into the wilderness with only a loaf of bread and a water skin. We can imagine the hurt and pain that was caused through this separation, through this casting out of Ishmael, casting out of Hagar. And then we still, as we look back and we have an agreement between the religious leaders and the Jewish faith, and the religious leaders in the faith of Islam. And how often or in often does that actually happen? They actually agree that Ishmael is the patriarch of the religion of Islam. He is the patriarch of the people in Arabia. He is the father of that group. And isn't it interesting to see after all of these thousands of years that the sins of the father have continued to plague the sons and the generations many times over. These two families still are at each other's throat. How different would the world have been if those two boys had grown up together loving each other? How different would the world be today if those two boys had never been separated when they were small children. And we see in Exodus chapter 37 that it talks about the sins of the father will be born onto their generations for three or four generations. It has been much more than that, hasn't it? The sins of this broken family has borne through the generations of our world to this moment, we still know and watch this broken family and the sins of the father from the separation. It is amazing to see the impact of one story on the entire world. 
on both of their communities in such devastating, malicious, hurtful ways. So what does that mean for us today? We are in a world and a nation that is broken in our relationships as well. Nothing has changed, has it? We are still divided by our skin color, by our culture, by our language, by our families. There was an article written in The Federalist a few months ago, and it was talking about this concept of privilege. And how often do we hear these words of privilege and white privilege and social privilege and class privilege being talked about, argued? And they were discussing this concept of privilege of a two-parent home. That those who are raised in a two-parent home have a privilege over those raised in a single or broken home or those raised by figures that are not their father and mother. And the article goes on to argue whether it's actually privilege or it should actually be a right, that we should, it should be a right for people to be raised by two parents. And I know in my family, if it was just one of us raising our children, whether it would be Lauren or myself, it would be much more difficult. There are times when Lauren fills over the weaknesses that I have in my life, in my heart. When I am too strict with them, she gives them love. And there are moments where I'm sure she feels that she doesn't know how to handle a moment when the children have done something that deserves some type of discipline. But together, we're able to work it out and help each other and to overcome the weaknesses of the other. And this article was talking about how families with only one parent, it is much more difficult. And for those of you who are in those situations and you're raising children by yourself, God bless you. And amen. And we're praying because I know that if it was just me, I don't know what I would do. It would be very difficult. One of the statistics in this article was that children from broken homes or single family parent homes are three times more likely to not graduate from high school. And we also know that that is one of the benchmarks for those living above or below the poverty level, that those who do not graduate from high school have a vast higher percentage chance of living below the poverty level. And so this sins of the father, the sins of the parents, end up affecting the generations, three, four generations, maybe more down the road. It casts people into this lower level of ability to then therefore take care of their children and give them the opportunities to be successful in life. And the question becomes, where are we called as a church to be a stopgap in this system in our country? We've been talking over the last few weeks that we are called by God, not just for the conversion of the individual, but we are called by God for the transformation of this world into the kingdom of God. That we are called as Christians to be a part of that transformational process. So where are we called at David United Methodist Church right now in this moment to be a transformational process in this system of disadvantage? of this system of the sins of the parents. And we have that happening right here in our community. There are families right here in our community that are single parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, 
raising children? Where are we called to be a transformational process to change our community so that those children have the opportunity to be successful, so that it is not a three or four generational sin of the parents, but we stop it at this generation, that we help them overcome. And I believe that's why we're called to Davy Elementary. Not just to give them food for a weekend or to give them a pep talk before taking a test or to do some landscaping at the school so it looks like a nicer, more beautiful place. I believe it's for us to actually build relationships with these broken families and to help them overcome the sins of the parents, to help them overcome the sins of our community, to help them overcome the sins of the world, that we are called to be this spring, this spring of water that God allowed Hagar to see. Hagar was able to see this spring of water and was able to give her son Ishmael a drink so that he could survive, that he could flourish, that he could be the head of this nation. I believe we're called to be that spring right now for Davy Elementary and for the families in this community that are broken because of the sins of our past. We are called to be that spring of hope. We are called to be that spring of transformation so that these families in our community can see God and can see the beauty of life. Amen? So that is where we're being led, I believe, by the Holy Spirit. And so I ask you to pray in your heart, where is God going to use you in this moment? Because it's going to take the whole church to transform this community. It's going to take all of us. But I believe that's where we're being called. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God. Thank you for your church. Thank you for those that are here. And we ask you to keep all of us safe in this moment, all of us safe in this time as we have the courage to move out of our houses and come back together. But we feel it is important that we are together as a family as we worship you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. at both the front and the back open the doors Um, and they should have the ability to hold the door open and then the ushers are going to direct you one pew at a time to exit Um, 
We ask you just to be patient. If you have an issue, like you're using a walker or you're going to need somebody to come and pick you up from the roundabout, please just stay in your pew for right now. Tell the usher you're going to stay a bit and we'll have you go out last that way that we're not crossing over each other. So the ushers, if you want to start going ahead, we need two in the back and two in the front. And if you could, yep. So Corky, you don't need to be at the door because you got it open. So you can, there you go. side and you need to go out the other way then just stay seated and we'll let you um, yeah so the, the plates are in the back the offering plates are in the back if you need to do an offering just stay at your seat we'll have offering plates in the front next time but if, if you can't just go out the back and there's offering plates at each entrance 